Did you see the latest Nintendo newsletter? Whoa, nice graphics. I'd like to get my hands on that game. You mean you haven't played it yet? We can play it on my Nintendo Entertainment System. It's the Legend of Zelda, and it's really rad. Those creatures from Ganon are pretty bad. Octorox Tech Tech's levers, too. But with your help, our hero pulls through. Yeah, go Link. Yeah, get Zelda. Awesome. Intense. The Nintendo Entertainment System. Your parents help you hook it up. The Legend of Zelda sold separate. In 1988, the video game market in the United States was summed up in one phrase. Nintendo Mania. We don't know how to free Zelda, but we do know why kids love them and critics hate them. John Stossel reports, nuts for Nintendo, when 2020 continues. Nintendo is much more than that. Nintendo is, well, almost the most fun a kid can have. Here's Joel Loy. Our video game industry is hotter than ever this season, and one good reason, Nintendo has introduced some hot new toys. Nintendo had an absolute stranglehold on the North American market. All of the video game console manufacturers could barely take a breath with Nintendo's grip over third-party developers and its borderline Orwellian control over retailers, many of whom wouldn't dare challenge Nintendo for fear of lost profits. A few companies managed to make reasonable profits in the areas of the market Nintendo couldn't control. Notable at this time, Atari was having somewhat of a comeback. Under the leadership of Michael Katz, Atari's home console business began to grow with a bold strategy of bringing the Pro System back and selling it at $30 cheaper than the next console, cementing it as a solid bargain buy, thus allowing the 7800 Pro System to be sold as a budget console. Also, Atari began to look for games outside the arcade looking more to computer game developers that had seemingly been ignored by Nintendo. This approach netted Atari its best profits since 1982, with sales of around $452 million. This paled in comparison to Nintendo's billion-dollar business, but it was a solid step for Atari in challenging Nintendo's dominance. This success didn't go unnoticed by another company trying to break into the North American market, Enter Sega. Sega had struggled with the Master System, opting to have Taka market the system for them, figuring the toy giant would have inroads with retailers that Sega didn't. But by 1988, Nintendo had basically forced the Master System into an early grave, with the system barely making headway. Taka didn't quite understand the nature of the home video game market, and the company struggled to sell and market the system. That, and the oppressive control of retailers that Nintendo demonstrated, all but ensured the Master System was dead on arrival. Sega had taken the Master System back from Tonka with the hopes of selling off the remaining stock and turning a small profit. By 1989, Sega had plans to introduce a new system in North America that, based on its sheer power, would be a contender against Nintendo. Only Sega wasn't sure they had the muscle to challenge the giant Nintendo themselves. David Rosen, one of the original founders of Sega, approached Atari, the very same company that had turned away Nintendo's NES. David Rosen approached them to be a potential partner and or buyer of the Mega Drive, Sega's new console that could bring almost arcade-perfect games into the living room. Dave Rosen came to Atari and asked if we'd be interested in taking over the manufacturing, marketing, and distribution of the Genesis. We came very close to making a hefty licensing deal so that Atari could jump into the 16-bit fray before Nintendo. The negotiations went pretty far down the stream, and as I recall, they fell apart when Jack and Dave Rosen couldn't agree to the terms. Then Sega decided to just do it themselves. Michael Katz, President, Video Game Division, Atari Corporation. There is more to the story than just a single quote in the ultimate history of video games. Scott D. Williamson has an interesting account of events during that period. The Mega Drive couldn't be called that in the United States due to a trademark issue. Sega, according to Scott D. Williamson, was calling the system the Tomahawk because of its aggressive fit with the history of North America. We were originally hired to write games for the Tomahawk. That was the name that Sega gave their new Mega Drive system for North America. From what I know, Atari VP Larry Siegel had been brokering a deal where I believe Atari would be the North American, possibly worldwide distributor for the system and its games. Sega was looking for an aggressive American name for the console. That's what led to the name Tomahawk, but we didn't like it very much. We had an office contest to see who could come up with a better name, and I think the prize was a steak dinner. Steve Rhino came up with the name Genesis, either as the console that would redefine gaming or after the effect in the Star Trek II movie. 
Either way, it stuck. The deal later fell through, and I don't know if Steve ever got his prize, but that is seriously how the Sega Genesis got its name. Anyway, I was getting ready to write games on the 68000 when the deal fell through. Scott D. Williamson, former Atari programmer. Scott D. Williamson's story that Atari gave the Genesis its name is interesting and an insight into the deal that was in the works between Sega and Atari, potentially signifying that Atari and Sega had reached a working agreement that allowed for this collaboration. However, the more common story for the name Genesis is that a random marketing firm came up with the name because it meant New Beginning, and was signed off on by David Rosen. The story about Atari giving the name Genesis fits with the timeline, but the story is not confirmed by Michael Katz nor Lawrence Siegel with Michael Katz adding that he didn't recall the Genesis having a working title from North America when they were approached by Sega. And so it was. He brought forth Genesis. Sega and Atari had seemingly a promising start to their negotiations. Atari was even exploring some early development ideas for the Genesis, according to Scott D. Williamson, on AtariH.com. This, however, could have been caused by the hype within Atari about the potential deal, and not actually signifying a set agreement. The notion of Atari and Sega working together to distribute the Genesis would have given the system a pretty wide library of games, pulling from both Sega and Atari's respective libraries. According to Michael Katz, Sega and Atari came close to a deal. The deal is stated to have gone south over a key issue. One reason stated on Wikipedia is that the deal fell apart over international distribution rights. The Tremel stated that they wanted everything outside of Japan. It can be argued that Sega saw this as a serious issue because of one of Sega's main successes during the Master System period was Europe and Brazil. So for Atari to demand that was a bit more than Sega was willing to give up in order to launch the Genesis in North America with a partner. This however wasn't the entire story. The deal as per Michael Katz was that it wasn't going to be a distribution deal but an outright ownership of the 16-bit technology or at the very least a long-term licensing deal for many years. Michael Katz saw the Genesis as a perfect fit for Atari. Not only was the Genesis a great system, but its technology would jump Atari into the 16-bit era ahead of Nintendo. According to Lauren Siegel, a VP and later president of Atari, the deal never quite reached the level it needed to. Despite the eagerness of the Tremels, there was something in the way of reaching a viable deal. The Tremels themselves. The deal fell apart because the Tremels were the Tremels. Specific deal points may have been the excuse at the time, but the Tremels were unlike any people I've ever known before or since. The Tremels wanted the hardware, but anyone that knew them would have known making a deal with them would have been an insurmountable challenge. Management was hopeful, but realistic. The programmers like Scott only heard the hype. It was never imminent. It went from cocktail chit chat to discussions to negotiations, but floundered before the attorneys could screw it up. Michael Katz's account of events backs this perspective. Katz stated that the deal progressed to the point that all they had to do was have Jack agree to the deal and approve the payments for the Genesis system. However, Jack decided not to give the deal the funding it needed, and it died there. Michael Katz states that the Tremels never really wanted to get Atari back into the gaming space like it had been in the early 80s, and instead wanted to challenge Commodore in the home computer space. So the Genesis wasn't as big a priority the deal with Sega fell apart because of the Tremels. It's written that the Tremels were fine pursuing the ST line instead of the Genesis, stating that they had thought the system would be too expensive and not market well. Atari under Michael Katz had marketed themselves as a budget option for consumers, so their strategy for the Genesis may not have worked. There was potential for Atari to take the Genesis and go head to head with Nintendo, especially given the talents of Michael Katz, who laid much of the foundation for Sega's success later when he launched the Genesis for them. Lawrence Siegel has his own perspective about the event, and whether or not Atari actually had what it took to take on Nintendo. Atari never had a chance. Without access to the best software, it was a fool's errand. The ST was at the end of its life too, except for the music folks who loved the MIDI ports. The last shot was the Lynx, which was acquired because the company was going bust. It was phenomenal hardware and a great development system. Again, everything else, Sega's handheld and NEC's handheld, we all failed to the crappy Game Boy because it had all the software. An event that could have reshaped the gaming landscape as we know it was ultimately held in the hands of the Tremels. 
When looking at what could have happened, a lot of key pieces for success were at Atari in 1989, had the deal gone through. Notably, the Genesis and Michael Katz. Katz was the person responsible for laying the foundation that made Sega successful in their console war against Nintendo. Katz built a bold strategy around more than just games. He tied them in with larger-than-life celebrities, like Buster Douglas and Joe Montana, building IPs that drew from outside the established gaming mainstays. Given time and the talents of Michael Katz, paired with the name recognition of Atari as a brand, could have been a game changer. But the harsh reality was that the perspective of the Tremels didn't fit with what was needed to make the deal workable. Atari would ultimately go down its own path. Sega, however, would embark on their own directly against Nintendo, eventually dethroning the juggernaut. If Sega and Atari had joined forces, who knows what could have happened? But it's a fascinating tale of what if. Thank you very much for watching the Historic Nerd today. A special thanks to Michael Katz and Lawrence Siegel for their willingness to answer questions in this video. Both men have contributed a great amount to the North American video game industry, and their time on this project is greatly appreciated. There are a couple YouTubers I want to thank for this project. Yahel from Wrestles with Gaming, Avalanche Jared Reviews, and Genovi Retro Impressions. Links to their respective channels will be in the video description. But I want to thank you again for watching Historic Nerd, and I hope you have a wonderful day, evening, or night, or whatever it is you're doing. Bye.